Second, we'll open our minds to a message from the Word of God, messages from the Word of God. The subjects that uh, we are be, we'll be talking about this weekend are subjects that I believe are uh, touch on areas that are very rampant uh, among the God's brethren. About uh, oh, a number of years ago, uh, too many to remember. Uh, I began being very concerned about some of the trends I was seeing in the Lord's Church. What I began noting is uh, brethren coming in just dragging their chin on the ground, uh, weak and weary, and the joy was not there, and the things God promised just didn't appear to be in the congregation or in people's lives. And it distressed me to a great deal as to God has made promises, and yet somehow we have not captured the fulfillment of those promises by a life that has meaning. And so along the way, I ended up back in school about three times. And along the way, I ended up with uh, taking some tests. And I've got some papers that hang on my wall and say that I uh, have some labels. Uh, when I sign my name, I sign, I need a line that long anymore. But all that means is I signed uh, that I took some extra tests and have some licensures and certifications. It is indeed a, just a great privilege to be back in this area again. This is my first time back in the area since about 20 years ago. And I, as I look at some of you all, if I look real close, it's like, do I know you or don't I? Because I, many of you I knew, um, one young lady I met this evening that I knew her when she was crawling around on the floor because I was with her parents. And uh, she introduced herself. So uh, I'm aware of how much time has passed. I've got very fond memories of the brethren in this area. I believe I was in this building when uh, the brethren moved over here from Highland Street many, many years ago. And I uh, remember some of the first excitement that happened in this building in terms of uh, the excitement of being in this area. It's good to see uh, the merging of congregations uh, that are within such a close uh, proximity to each other. And uh, just real, real happy to be back in this area and to let you know that I'm well and fine and I'm back at the pool. Tonight what I want to talk about is the subject of what is an addiction. When we look at addictive behaviors, um, you don't have to read your Bible very long before you realize the word addiction is not in the Bible. And so because it's not there, sometimes brethren raise the idea, well, is this something God really addresses? And the answer is absolutely. The Apostle Paul, am I punching the wrong one? That won't work. Okay. We'll figure out what works there. All right. The Apostle Paul talks several times in the Scriptures, and the terminology of the scriptures uses different language that means the same thing as we use today in terms of addiction. And I want to introduce in this lesson the idea that some things can gain power over us or they can overpower us. Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, in connection with some food and other things in that context, he said that he would not be brought under the power of any. And there he denotes that there are some elements, there are some things in this world that uh, can affect our body and can gain power over us. That concept of power uh, denotes that we can be entrapped by some of the things that are in this world. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, a passage we'll look at numerous times this weekend, uh, Paul talks about how that God has equipped us uh, with, with uh, spiritual weapons to the casting down of strongholds and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That word strongholds is a key passage because what he denotes is that Satan can make a stronghold in our life. Here's how that happens. Someone says, Lord, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to do what you want me to do in every area of my life except... And where that exception is, that's the area that Satan will move in and make a stronghold in our lives. And basically, what the word stronghold means is a fortress. It means that Satan can get into our lives and he can build, uh, build something around in our lives that becomes more important than God, more important than family, more important than life itself, and would make any sacrifice to satisfy that thing that is eating on the inside of us. That's an addiction. 
or at least as we'll define it this, this weekend. In the book of Daniel, the first chapter, verse 8 through 21, and some of these verses I'm just going to mention in passing, this is one. But you remember the Hebrew children, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they were taken down into captivity, and they were taken into the king's palace basically to, uh, to uh, learn the uh, customs of the people of that culture and to take that and train their own people. And in that process, the, uh, uh, as they were being groomed and taught, there were some things called the king's dainties. And if you remember that, Shad that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel refused to take the king's dainties. Now look at that context. Because what he's talking about here is the word dainties is a word for herb, herbs. And what it's talking about is that if you take these things, if you eat these things or partake of these, you'll be wiser, you'll, my, your mind's going to be expanded, you're going to be able to just outthink and outdo everybody else. And for some reason, and I don't really think the context bears out that these four young men were in rebellion against the king, but for some reason they said, we're not going to do that. They said no. And they challenged, let's do a kind of a little test here. Those that are going to take these dainties, go ahead, and we'll not take them. And at the end of the period of time, then we'll see who's the smarter and whose mind is greater and who's benefited the most from these things. And if you look at that real closely, what you'll see is the strength of faith that it took for these young men to stand up against a heathen king and stand up in his palace and tell that king no. And I believe that's the kind of courage we need today in our culture, in this day and time, the courage to stand up and when someone's offering us the dainties or those things that are those strongholds in our lives, those things that will bring us under the power of something, we need people of faith that will dare to stand up and say no. Two approaches I want to use this weekend. The first is that as we as we work in the church with, with our people who are Christians, many of us, including myself, were brought up in the church. And sometimes it's very easy to look over the fence at what we might have missed along the way. We've seen our worldly friends, we've seen them out here bragging about all the things they do, and we sometimes may get a little with a, a wishful thinking that maybe we would kind of like to go out and do what they do. I work in Indianapolis with, and I may as well say this at this point, I work with, uh, with uh, both ends of the spectrum. I work part of the day with formerly homeless veterans. Uh, I've got, and, and with a number of homeless people as well. But with these veterans, when I sit with them in a group, what these veterans tell me is, they're telling me they want what you have here in this audience this evening. When I go up on the other end of town and work with the rich and famous, and I literally mean that, the rich and famous, some names you would know, but I work with their families on the other piece of what I do down there, in addition to my private practice. And what I do when I sit and talk with these families, you know what I hear them talk about? I hear them talk about spirituality. I hear talk about the need for something in their life that is greater than themselves. I hear people talk about the need for prayer and the need for things that we have in our lives. And I just find it ironical that God's people want to look over the fence and be like them and they want to look over the fence and be like us. Folks, we got a good deal. And we need to hold on to what we got. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And let's not be looking over the fence and see what's over there that we're missing. I'll tell you what you're missing. You're missing a lot of torment. You're missing the things we're going to talk about this weekend in, in these lessons. And some of these are pretty, pretty, serious, pretty bad stuff. We as Christians are commanded to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. James 1.27. That's part of pure religion. And notice that word, pure. The second thing is that as... Those of us who have been brought up in the church need to guard our hearts and lives. There are those who have come in from the outside to the inside, and the outside continues to call them with familiar things. In deep inside of your brain, if you were to take your one finger put here and one put here, and 
follow those lines, right in the middle of your brain, there's a, there's a part of your brain, your primal brain, called your amygdala. You don't have to remember that, but here's what it does, and this is important. What it does is it collects every behavior you've ever done. Now, it's, uh, that in itself is, doesn't have a conscience. It's just collecting everything that you know how to do. Anytime that you run into something that's similar to what you have done, those things try to pair up. And so anytime that we have, in, that we have behaviors in our life, good or bad, that we've ever done, then there will always be that tendency to pair that one back up. I believe that is part of why God tells us to stay away from some things. There are some things that are shameful even to speak of. There are some things that never were intended to go through our brain. Keeping ourselves pure and taking on the good things. Those are things God wants us to do and not to fill our lives with poor behaviors and with trash and that sort of thing. And here's what I believe is part of that reason. God has his reasons. But what I know is that any time that we have those behaviors, they will tend to come back at the strangest time. If you don't believe that, what was Peter doing as he denied that he knew, knew his Lord? He was cursing and swearing. Where'd that come from? After three years of walking with the Lord. We go back to that which is familiar, as did Peter in his moment of weakness. That amygdala pairs things up. So those that are coming into the church have quite a task to unlearn some of the old stuff and to relearn and reprogram with the, with the new stuff. There was a gentleman down uh, in Indianapolis that made this statement. He said, you know, I didn't start out thinking I'd be here. Uh, he's talking about a group I had. He said, I had a great swisher, a bag, a pipe, and a syringe. And I just went out and had a good time. But I didn't come back. I couldn't find the path. I was on the end of a pipe all along thinking, Someday, someday it will be different, but not today. The addict will wait for tomorrow. When it comes to addictions, we must loudly proclaim, the thing that you are playing with is not playing with you. When you play with sin, when you play with addiction, addiction will never be satisfied until it owns you or has you in the grave. Here's a Bible verse that says the same thing. It's in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, and verse 13, maybe 2 Timothy. And what it says is, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What that says is that sin is progressive. That where you start is not where you stop. So here's a person who goes out, and they or a friend stops by and says, hey, come on, go for a ride with us. And they get in the car and they pass them, you know. Take a tote. You know, pass, pass a little cigarette around. You know, everybody take a drag off of it or whatever. Uh, so we're going to, or take a hit, so we call it either. But uh, we're going to take a hit off this thing. So we pass it around. Now you've got a choice. You can either take a hit or you can pass it on. But if you don't take a hit, then your friends are going to kind of look at you and go funny. So you got to kind of get caught up in stuff sometimes. And what starts out as something just to see what it's like can turn out into a, turn into a full-blown addiction for you. Satan can get a hold in your life. And I'm going to talk about how that happens here in just a moment. But the clear thing is, the thing you're playing with isn't playing with you. Addiction is not satisfied until it owns everything about you. Until it owns your life, your soul. It will rob you of your family. It will rob you of your spirituality. It will leave you a shell. And ultimately, it will be death or insanity for you. Definitions in the Bible uh, we need to look at that accompany the, uh, the uh, thing of addictions. And that is that the Bible talks about strongholds. We identified that. Uh, Peter talks about Satan, like a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. I want you to look at that word devour. Because devour is not a nice word. Devour is a bloody, torn up flesh word. Satan is not out playing with us. That the things he throws at us are intended to devour and to consume our lives to where we have no room for God. 
Drunkenness is also uh, talked about in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, as a work of the flesh. And the text there says that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you want to go to heaven, there's some things you cannot and I cannot do if we want to go to heaven. I'm assuming all of us want to go to heaven. Am I right on that? And so if we're going to go to heaven, there are some things that we don't do. But guess what? When you became a child of God, you already made that decision. You don't have to wait until someone says, well, what are you drinking tonight? You already made that decision. I'm not going to do that. When someone says, well, here, you know, take a hit off this. We've already made that decision that we're not going to follow the works of the flesh. When we, are, when we have given our life to Jesus, it's no longer we that live, but Christ who lives in us, then we've made the decision a long time ago, I'm not going to do that. Don't wait until you're in a situation to make the decision. Make the decision now. That's part of your surrender to the Lord. In the same passage on the works of the flesh, we find uh, the word sorcery or witchcraft. Um, depends on your translation there. But basically that word is a word that is a Greek word pharmakia, which is the word we get pharmacy from. It's the mixing of potions to cast a spell. And what he's talking about here is the use of drugs. Uh, drugs to cast spells. And that's in the work of the flesh. Now in case we missed it, either one of those, we find the such life. And such life, and he said, of which I tell you that those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 7, also chapter 6 and verse 9, passage there talks about how we need to avoid the snare of the devil. And the snare is a trap. It's something that you don't see it until you're in it, and then it springs on you. And there we need to avoid the snare of the devil. And then we also learn uh, how that wine is a deceiver. Strong drink is a deceiver. And those that are deceived thereby are not wise. In our lessons this weekend, I am going to blend Scripture with some of the things that I know also from my secular world. And I'm going to try to blend those in such a way to show you that what I do in my secular world is the same thing I do in the pulpit. And, uh, and what I tell people Often, I tell them in, in my practice the things that I tell you all in church. And fortunately, I'm, I'm uh, privileged to be able to have those conversations with, with people in the settings in which I serve them. Now, there are, if nothing else is wrong with the, with the addictions, uh, in terms of substance addiction, uh, whatever it might be, alcohol or drugs, if nothing else is wrong with that, then we need to look at the companions it keeps. Anybody ever tell you that you know, you, know, uh, you know how a person is by the company they keep? Well, here's the company that this keeps. We're told that the, uh, that the Gentiles think it's strange that we don't run with them to the same excess of riot, and they speak evil of us. 1 Peter 4 and 4, we're going to look at that in some detail here in a minute. But there we find that, there is, that the Bible talks about this as excess of riot. That's the companion. And other, other companions, it doesn't take long for me to be with a, with a group of people that are, have been down the road to, uh, in addictions, whether substance abuse or substance dependence, and it doesn't take long for them to talk about their sexual escapades. And here's why. Because as people get caught up in their chemicals, what they have effectively done is they put their brain to sleep in certain areas. And what they've done is they've turned on parts of their brain, and they've turned off parts of their brain. And particularly with the, with the chemical alcohol, uh, what we see is that the person turns off the frontal lobe of the brain. That is, that we, know, we have numbness in the front of the brain. We'll talk about that in a minute. But effectively what that does, what does the front part of your brain do? That's your center of moral consciousness. No wonder then when that's turned off, someone's drunk or someone's out here plastered on, on some chemical or, or messed up on some chemical, no wonder when that's when this part's turned off, guess what you get? You get sexual acting out, you get people wanting to fight, you get people being lovers, you get people uh, wanting to talk 90 miles a minute. By the way, if anybody ever calls you and they're drunk and wants you to help get them, uh, talk them down, don't give them coffee. You're going to not have a, you know, that's not going to have to get sober, you're going to have a wide awake drunk to talk to. <laughs> we'll talk more about that. Let 
don't sleep at all. Then talk to him. You don't wake him up. You're going to have a long night. <laughs> Deceptions and lying go with this, with the substance abuse, the substances of abuse. And so we find people that uh, will lie. Uh, someone said, you know, you know how much of an addict's lying? Their lips are moving. And that's just about right. Because an addict is going to find what they want, and they will lie. Well, your Bible still says all liars are going to find their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, Revelation 21, verse 8. And Romans 1, 33 uh, is a companion passage about children lying. Not only that, but we find people that are caught up in the, in the world of substance addiction uh, degrade their body. They will sell their body or use their body. You've got to pay for those drugs and chemicals some way. So how do you pay for it? That's what I asked the person the other day. I had a $200 a day heroin habit. But so how are you paying for this? Well, what he told me is he had a savings account. <laughs> and I had to laugh uh, because I've never met an addict with a savings account. Uh, that you can spend two hundred dollars a day on. He didn't make that much in, in the job that he had that he lost. Uh, but he didn't have any savings account. I know how he got his money. He got his money by selling himself on the street. When that didn't work, he would steal. And when that didn't work, then uh, then he would be out carrying drugs for somebody else uh, and transporting in exchange for his own drugs. That's how he got his drugs. But that's not what he told me. And out here degrading their own uh, their own bodies. 1 Peter 4, verse 1 through 4. Let's look at this in more detail. It's the verse we talked about just a moment ago. And I want you to read this with me, either in your Bible or from the screen. And it says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. You see what that says? What that says is you and I are not to live our lives for the lust of men or the lust of others. And what he says is that we are to live for the will of God. Look at this. For the time already, for the time already past is sufficient for you. Now look at that. What it says is whatever you've done in your past, that's enough. Quit it. That's enough. It is more than enough. It is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the heathen or Gentiles. Having pursued, look at this, a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, and look at these words, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation or riot, and then malign you or make fun of you. I want you to look at that. There's three words in there that I specifically want to note. First is that when you hang out with God's people, you're going to be the odd person out when you're hanging out with the world. Because the time that you have lived in the world is sufficient. It's enough. And there needs to be enough distance between us and the world to where the world recognizes we're not one of them. Now look at what he says here. He talks in this passage in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 4, about the excess of wine. And that is from a Greek word that means an overflowing of wine. Drunkenness, or basically falling down drunk, the staggering, uh, staggering drunk. We've all seen those. The next word he used in there was the word revelings, and the word revelings from a word that means a nightly carousing, half drunken revelry, or a drunken party. I would think that would be kind of descriptive of the club scene, where not everybody's falling down drunk, but they're out clubbing. They, they uh, caught them a buzz. Uh, out here doing whatever in the club, um, kind of everybody feeling, feeling good is the way they would put it, versus the one that's out here puking and falling down. He talks about that, and he condemned that in those verses as excess of right. But look at that third one, banquetings or carousings. That's from yet another Greek word that means a drinking 
not of necessity excessive, a drinking party and to sit. Now here's what he's talking about. Any of you who've been out in the world know what I mean when you say, or when we say, that someone is walking around nursing the bottle. We're not talking about little babies. We're talking about a person that goes out, they get them a little drink, a little social drink, they kind of walk around with their little cup in their hand, they have a sip every once in a while, they've got a bottle, and they may take that through their whole evening, they may have two or three. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about social drinkers. And I want you to look very clearly. That passage condemns all three levels. They're in the same verse. And they're all called excess of right. Sometimes my brethren say, well, Art, you shouldn't be so hard on social drinkers. And what I say to them is, well, first, I'd like to invite you to come to my groups and hear people who don't know the Lord like you know them, who know better than some of us on the side of the fence. I don't hear any of them trying to tell me, well, I just need to have a little bit. I hear all of them saying, how do I stay away where I don't have a little bit? Because I know one's going to lead to another, to another, to another. Let me make this distinction before I go any further. And that is, in our population, in the population just in general, 80% of the people of the population is going to be able to take or leave certain things. But 20% aren't. 20% from the time that they take that first drink or that first use, they will not be able to stop. Their bodies respond differently than the other 80%. And here's the problem. We don't know which is which. All we know is that once they start, that 20% can't stop. The 20% can't stop are the ones that stop off with a happy hour, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're shutting the bar down and uh, trying to figure out how to get home. And they've gone through several shifts of people. Why can't they stop? It's the person that goes out and, and takes one hit, and before you know it, here we go, and all of our money is gone, and, and we've auctioned off or pawned off whatever it is we had, and uh, made promises even that we can't keep. There's a book called the DSM 4 TR, which is the diagnostic manual that is used to uh, basically to diagnose what's going on with individuals. And here's the things that we look for. Uh, what's going on with individuals in terms of addiction. The things that we look for are basically about seven different things, and this is true regardless of what the chemical is, whether it's alcohol or any other kind of substance uh, of abuse. What we look for is increased or decreased tolerance. What that means is it takes more of the same thing to get the person the same effect. Essentially, it means that when a person uh, has their first experience and they experience that first before, uh, 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 buzz or whatever it is that they're getting, uh, when they experience that, they go back and use the same amount maybe the next time, same amount maybe the next time, but now it's not giving quite the, quite the buzz it used to. The other thing is decreased tolerance. A decreased tolerance concerns me even more than increased tolerance. Because when we have decreased tolerance, what that tells me is the person has a significant pancreas or liver problem. Something really is going on is damaged inside because they're not processing their chemicals like they used to. And that, uh, that decreased tolerance uh, often uh, come, often is a, is a very significant health issue. Uh, increased tolerance, uh, we'll talk about that more in just a moment, but withdrawal symptoms. When a person stops using, uh, using their chemical, we know what hangovers are. You've heard of those if you haven't experienced one. Hangover is you get up the next morning, man, they talk about chasing the hair of the dog or got to chase it down with another, another shot or something uh, just to take the edge off. Um, you know, loud noises uh, disturb you or someone's kissing the toilet bowl, uh, just puking their guts out. Um, those, are, those would be withdrawal symptoms. Other withdrawal symptoms depends on the chemical. You might have the sweaty palms. You might have that irritability, generalized confusion. Um, or some other symptoms that uh, we'll talk about in some other lessons. The other piece here is inability to control or quit. Here's a person says, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then they go right back to it. Often what happens when a person says, I'm going to stop, they say, well, you know, I'm going to stop my alcohol, but I think I'll smoke pot instead. 
And all you're doing is you're just changing one drug for another. The addiction is still there. Just change forms. Okay, we'll talk more about that as we go through the weekend. We find people using over a longer period of time than they intended, and then continue to use despite consequences. Uh, so here's a person that's out here doing, uh, doing their substances, and uh, someone's catching them. They're in trouble with church. Uh, they're in trouble maybe with their job, uh, in trouble with whatever, uh, in their family life. But they keep on using it. They don't quit. And what does that tell you? It tells you someone's got a stronghold going on with them. And then we find preoccupation. Our mind's dwelling on that all the time. By the way, what your mind dwells on, your body will act on. What you put in here is going to come out in your behavior. Now the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now the abundance of the heart, the mouth of the body also acts. What you dwell on is what you will end up doing. And then blackouts. The blackouts are not, uh, are not fainting. But there are periods of time the person looks coherent, they talk coherent, and then the next morning when you uh, ask them about it, they don't have any idea what they did. This is the person waking up the next morning with somebody in bed and they don't know how they got there or what went on or, uh, or whatever. This is the person, uh, like the young lady who woke up in the jail cell and uh, she had been arrested the night before because she'd taken all her clothes off and chased a cop car uh, down the street barking. And when they told her she did that, she was horrified. But she had no recall of it. That's a blackout. They're not all that extreme, but that, those are extreme cases. It's a fact. Every class of abuse substance, except nicotine, has the capacity to produce or to mimic symptoms of other psychiatric disorders. And what that means is that when people are on their drugs or their alcohol, it is hard for the person who is trying to make a medical or a psychological evaluation, it's hard to tell what is it we're measuring. Is this a mental disorder or is this a substance-induced disorder? And what we usually do in treatment is we have to get them sober to see what's left. And is this something that really is a mental illness uh, or is it something that's drug-induced? Now, the question I would have is why on earth would anybody want to act crazy? But that's exactly what people do when they put these uh, substances of abuse in their bodies. Um, God has only asked us to stay away from the things that are going to hurt us. That's all he's asked you to do. Just stay away from what will hurt you. And he knows what's going to hurt you, so he tells you. And he says, stay away from those things. I want to go on a little journey here and, um, and uh, talk a little bit about, about uh, some painful stuff uh, that people have experienced. Addiction is cunning, baffling, and deceitful in a person's life. It does not care about the other person's plan. It doesn't care about your plan. If you want to go down this route, it doesn't care what your plan is because it has a plan of its own. I say this with all honesty and, um, and after great thought. And that is that I have never met an addict yet that at the core of his addiction, but that at the core of their addiction was some very serious kind of pain. Whether it be childhood trauma, whether it be something that they interpreted painfully, but something that they are running from in their lives. And it's being masked and self-medicated with the substances of abuse. It takes me a while sometimes to do that. One young man took nine months to get to it, almost the same amount of time it took him to be developed and come to this earth. But finally, he told the story of abuse by the babysitters. And he told that very painful. I've had others have told me numerous stories. Do you realize that 80% of the females who use drugs and alcohol, that 80% of them have been abused? Not all sexual, these are types of abuse, but 80% have been abused. And of the men, 60% report being abused, but I think it's probably more like 80, because men don't always admit some things. And I think it's probably more like that. The word oblivion, you've heard someone use the expression, I'm, I'm drink to oblivion, I'm drinking to forget and be forgotten. On the outside, what we see is the individual who's caught up in this stronghold, and there's cravings. That is, it's the call of that chemical. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on. 
the chemical is calling their name, uh, their behaviors. Uh, we're going to see addictive behaviors. Fact is, you probably will see a person with dry drunk and dry substance behavior before you actually see the introduction of the chemical because what they're doing is they're building up to use, they're building up to drink, and you're going to see the behaviors start to change. Remember a guy named Nehemiah in the Old Testament? A fellow named Nehemiah, and he was asked the question by the king, why is your countenance falling? Now, where, where's your countenance? Everyone's got one. It's your facial expressions, it's the way you carry yourself. And what you'll be able to tell before people get caught up in this stuff, there usually is going to be a progression that their countenance is going to fall, they're going to look a little different, they're going to have a different look on their face, there's going to be something different about them, and what they're doing is they're building up to use. And that's the point at which we can do some intervention with them if we are attuned to that uh, and to those in our family that are starting to, to show a little bit different kind of behavior. It's progressive. I've heard people say, well, I have to drink or use in order to feel normal. And then with gender differences, uh, women get drunk, drunker and higher quicker than men. It doesn't take as much. Uh, part of that is genetic factors, part of that's body mass. Um, but uh, but women, uh, women tend to uh, tend to get drunker or, or uh, uh, messed up on drugs uh, quicker than men, and they're harder to detox than men. Um, now, women usually, and I'm going to make two general statements, women usually get caught up in alcohol and drugs because there's some guy in their life that thinks that if I can get them drunk, or get them wasted, then I can have my way with them. That's usually how that happens. That's usually a, a teenage kind of a thing. Um, Men, on the other hand, tend to get drunk more as a drunk or use more as the rite of passage, so that we're not chicken. Uh, that we, you know, that we're gonna man up and have one with, with boys. And so men tend to do it for a little, tend to get into it for a little different reason. Whatever the deal is, there is a path that's taken. This particular chart tells us, and I want you to look at the white line because that's the baseline of what is normal in a person's life. Uh, wherever normal is for you. Someone asked me to define normal, and I'll tell you uh, before you ask me, uh, well, first I've asked a good man here is normal. Uh, uh, but I'm going to tell you what normal is. Normal is a composite of all the abnormals. So think about that for just a moment. Why is the thing abnormal? It's because it's spiky. When you bring all those abnormals in a range, is there not a little bit of, uh, of um, uh, um, selfishness in all of us? Is there not just a little bit of antisocial in all of us? Is there not just a little bit of depression in all of us? Is there not just a little bit of like to stir stuff up in all of us? There's a little bit of all of that. When you bring that in a range, it's kind of what normal is. But back to our chart. Um, you may or may not agree with that. But the uh, white line would represent whatever normal is for you or for a person that's getting ready to use. The first time they use, um, the first use, whatever the chemical is, they get up here and elevate, hey, this was, that was really cool. That was, man, that was great. And so then they continue to do that. By the time we're into several episodes of this with the same amount, what we notice is we're not getting as high or not getting the buzz we used to get. And But you also notice that not only is the high lower, but the low is lower. You see that? Then what happens as we keep in that same pattern, going down the chart, same amount, but not getting the same effect, then what happens is that over time now, we are down here to where the low is real low. That's depression. And the high is not even up to normal. So what's this mean? This person is starting to use just to try to feel normal again. Their chemistry is way off. Their brain's firing way out of range here. Okay, what are you going to do? You've got three choices. You can either ride it out, that means white knuckle it, and detox without any help whatsoever. That's, that's an option. Uh, as long as you don't go into seizures and DTs uh, or some other, uh, other medical things that people die from. Uh, uh, the other thing is what you can do is you can take more. So whereas I may be smoking a joint, now I may want to go to blunts. Or I may be out here saying, well, you know, this alcohol is not getting it for me. I need to start doing shots. 
And so we increase the, the type of alcohol, or the, the, the proof of the alcohol, and you know what that will do? That will take me right back there. See that? So the other thing is we can add a stronger, uh, stronger substance, or we can start mixing stuff. And that will give us the same thing. But ultimately, we start running out of options, and here we are. And we no longer have the capacity to feel normal in our lives. I want to end with this. And we'll take a little break. These are what's called spec scales. Sometimes we work with adolescents and the adolescents say, well, you know, I can use this and it really doesn't affect me. <clears throat> and then we, uh, Dr. Amen actually is the one that uh, did these. The areas here where there's different colors, that's not because we have different colors of brains, uh, but that's because we have different areas in our brain that are turned on <laughs> to whatever degree uh, at a particular time. That's what your brain, four pictures of your, four angles of your brain, that's what you would look like if you were normal. If you had a stroke, then this would be the kind of effect that we would expect to see. These areas here are not holes in your brain, but they are areas that have been turned off. And so they don't show up here. They're, they're just, they're not working. That would be uh, typical of a stroke, a stroke victim. So with Alzheimer's, those would be the areas. Can you start seeing a little bit as to why people may have trouble connecting thoughts and all because pieces of the brain are not, are not turned on. By the way, if you want to ride a bicycle or a helmet, that's, that's free, I'll charge for that. Uh, but uh, uh, the real reason not to use drugs is that substances damage your brain and they also limit your potential to access yourself. We'll talk more about that on Sunday. Here's a person on cocaine and methamphetamine. By the way, uh, uh, methamphetamine is a synthet synthetic drug. You all have a meth problem around here? Anybody know? Okay. Methamphetamine is a synthetic. Uh, in the clubs, there's a form of that called ecstasy, uh, which is one of club drugs. Uh, and basically what we see with methamphetamine is it is so potent that as it fires through the brain, what it, all, all, let me back, all the substances as they fire through the brain cause the natural chemicals in your brain to shut down or to turn down or to turn off. Because the brain is, at, is saying, wait a minute, this thing that's fitting in this receptor cell, this chemical is fitting in here, and there's too much of it. So the body, the brain, turns off its natural reactor or chemical, chemical transmitter, and now the artificial is taking place in doing what that, what that natural does. Here's what happens with methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is so strong that when it's firing through the brain to those axons and butons in your brain, that it is so strong that when it goes through, that it literally damages the axons and butons in your brain as it fires through. It cauterizes those. Now, effectively, what that means is that if you've been using this for any, any period of time, that when you quit, that the decision to quit and to detox and get your act together is a decision to go into major depression for six months to two years or longer. That's the bad news. The good news is that your brain will heal most of the way. And you can have a relatively normal life again. But the bad news is it's going to take a while to get through that journey of that two months to years. That's why people relapse. Because what they know is, as soon as I did it again, I'm feeling great. I don't have to suffer my depression. I can hit it again, and I'm back in the game. But what they also don't realize is when they do that, they've got to go through that whole detox journey again. And it just gets worse and worse as you go. Alcohol, that's what alcohol does to your brain. And remember, these are actual pictures of people's brain. These folks didn't think their chemicals were bothering them until they looked at the pictures. Uh, and that's, that's uh, the brain on alcohol, on heroin. You see the parts of the center colors are changing as the chemicals change. Uh, different activities going on in the brain where people aren't acting themselves. 
That's why the person on heroin may break into your house. And of all the frightening things I've heard, um, one of the uh, person told me what they used to do when they were on heroin. They said, I don't know why, but when I was on heroin, I would get a kick out of breaking into people's houses and going into their bedroom and just standing there and watching them sleep and not have to do anything I wanted to to them. And then as I finished my little, my little journey on my heroin, what I'd do is I would sneak back out the way I came in. You know what? If you woke up in the middle of the night and saw someone doing that, would that just scare you to death? The stories I hear from these folks are enough, are enough to scare you, enough to make you put extra deadbolts in. <laughs> someone says, well, you know, they don't legalize marijuana. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't affect you. Really? See how the colors change? And you see the areas of inactivity in the brain? Cocaine and alcohol. This picture is personal methamphetamine. These are mug shots, so it's legal to show those. This is a guy that was picked up, first time he was picked up for the use of meth. That's what he looked like on the left. And then five years later, that's what the life of a drug addict did to him. Five years later. But it gets better. So, you know, the thing that's most effective when I talk with teenage girls about this or young ladies, I tell them, if you keep this up, you're going to be ugly. And some of them quit because they don't want to be ugly. <laughs> they don't care about all that other stuff and tell them, like, well, I don't want to look like that. Like, well, you better quit. No, okay. And then here we go. And now they're in recovery. It's like, well, that's what it takes. That's all right with me. But it will. It'll make you ugly. That's what sin will do to you, folks. You know, you might be a year and a half from looking like that. Now, if you notice the bumps and scabs on these people, you know what that is? When we hyperstimulate our skin, it feels like something's crawling underneath us. And these folks literally have dug their skin and dug holes in themselves. Does that look like a picture of self-control to you? Folks, God's word is sufficient. Addiction is a false way to try to achieve spirituality. And I'm going to stop there and we're going to take a break. And then we'll talk about alcohol.